Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today I'm going to be bringing on Vea. Now she resides in the Italian Alps. She runs a small farm to table restaurant right on her own farm. I found out about her on the Homestead Mama's Instagram account. Find her life fascinating. I also just wanted to hear about what she's cooking right now in her restaurant, what seasonal things she's using, what are some Italian dishes that maybe I need to find out about that she's making over there that I need to try in my own kitchen. So join us for this discussion as we bring up all of those things. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. So thanks for joining me, even though our time difference makes this somewhat of a challenge. I really appreciate you jumping on. Can you introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah. So I am Vea. I am Italian and I live in the Italian Alps. Uh, so far north and next to the border with Austria, in Dolomites, that area. And I live in a very small farm, on a very small farm with my family. But almost all farms up here are not that big. <laughs> we are, we're not used to American size farms because there is not that much land. So they have to be small. And uh, it's me, my husband, and we have three kids already, three teenagers. And... Yeah. <laughs> oh, and uh, we have a farm to table restaurant. Oh, and that. <laughs> yes. And, and that. that. Yeah. <laughs> so when you say small, I'm curious what that means. Like, what size? So in acres, I think it should be something around three acres, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure because we use hectares, but right, right, yeah, should be. <laughs> Yeah, Something somewhere like around that. there. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. You can fit a lot yeah. on that size of property. I think mm -hmm. people do need that encouragement too, because I've seen people with full blown farms on two acres. It can be done. Yeah. Yes, it absolutely can be done. And it was done in this area. Uh, it was very, very typical because uh, people in the mountains were very much isolated and they had to live on what the their farm was providing. So, and the season is very short and the land is very steep, but they managed it. So, yeah, yeah, you can do it. Definitely. I originally found you on the Homestead Mamas page and um, just tell us what, what do you raise on your farm? So we have a little bit of everything and that was, uh, that is the main idea. So to recreate um, a traditional mountain farm, as I said before, they were small, but they were really trying to uh, be self-sufficient. Right. So we grow vegetables mainly, and then we have sheep, we have pigs, we have um, a field uh, that it's a little bit lower in altitude so that we can grow um, potatoes and corn, and we have a little bit of um, orchard. Uh, we have bees and we have hens. Well, you managed to have a lot based on the amount of acreage that you have. You managed to cover like pretty much everything. So where is the restaurant and is the restaurant close to your farm and do you raise a lot of the things that you actually serve in your restaurant? Yes, the restaurant is really, um, so the house, it was built in 1877 um, and then we, we built the, this small restaurant attached to the house. So, and I have a door <laughs> and I just go from the house to the restaurant, which is, oh, that's you know, so cool. Very, it's really cool. And, but sometimes it makes, you know, it's like this kind of mixture between private life mm -hmm. and work, but farmers, all farmers know that. And right. Um, right. our idea is to uh, give our guests mainly what we produce. Okay. That is why I want to talk to you. <laughs> this is right now it's winter and winter is a good time for cozy and comforting foods. And I just know that you probably have so many 
creative ideas for what you're making during this time. So I guess we could start with what are you serving in your restaurant right about now? Mm. So now it's, um, well, winter, as you can guess, it's always Mm -hmm. more um, challenging. (laughs) Yes, exactly, exactly. exactly. (laughs) Yes, Uh, we have, uh, we're very proud of our own corn with which we, uh, that I grind just before uh, dinner and we make polenta. Um, so polenta is, uh, I don't know if you, um, if you know what polenta is, the way that, how Italians have their corn. So we, um, I have an electric mill, so I grind it and then you cook it with water for quite a long time until it becomes like, a, um, a dough. <laughs> I don't know okay. how to say it. Yeah. And that's really typical in Italy at every latitude, especially in the north, though. Uh, and then we have potatoes now. And then I have uh, black kale. We have, of course, uh, krauts, sauerkrauts. Okay. So did you grow the cabbage and then ferment it whenever it was yeah. summer? Yeah. Oh, awesome. How yeah. many people do you serve in a day in your restaurant? We have five tables. So the maximum is 20 people, but uh, yeah. I would say the average is like 10, 12, which is, it's how we like it. So we can be yeah. care of our guests and we can, you know, I, I don't have to, it's not the, the classical, you know, cook job. You always in a hurry, very stressed right. and it's not nothing like that. I don't want that. I didn't right. want that. So are you changing the menu items sometimes on a daily basis or does it stick around for most of the winter time or mm, oh so usually i change it like on a monthly base uh okay. but i'm not too rigid about that yeah so how much since you do a lot of polenta how much corn do you guys put back i mean i'm assuming you must grow a lot i mean no uh because i mean the restaurant is small and uh Really, corn is quite um, efficient, (laughs) so Mm -hmm, you can get you can get really quite a lot of uh, polenta out of uh, not that much. And but we didn't invent anything on how we farm here. We really got ourselves inspired by our ancestors. Uh, Farming in the mountains can be really challenging. And we realized that there is not that much that we have to invent. Everything was already sorted out centuries. So we're trying to to stick to that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You don't really need to reinvent it, just embrace it. So did you you inherit the farm or did you guys buy it? How long have you been living this lifestyle? Hmm. Wow, that's a, a nice question. I was born in Tuscany, moved here, but we had a completely different plans. I was really the classical city girl and I moved here. Um, actually, we were looking for a motorcycle because my husband used to be a biker and I hated to uh, to travel as a passenger because it was really boring and at that time there were no microphones or ear pods to talk so it was right. incredibly boring so so I said okay I want to be a biker as well I want to have my own bike <laughs> and have some fun as well when we travel so we were looking for a motorbike actually and suddenly we found this um, this advertisement uh, they said uh, very isolated farm for nature lovers and we were not really thinking about it but my husband said okay let's go and have a look and it was in a in a very nice area where we used to hike a lot so we just had a look and he felt in love with it immediately and I was just like oh my gosh (laughs) where am I going now and you know when my mother first saw this house I was pregnant with my first child and we moved here and I really didn't know what I was doing. And my mother started to cry. (laughs) And she said, you are crazy, guys. What are you doing? Yeah, we've been here 20 years. And I never looked back. Okay, so yeah. You've raised your kids here completely. (laughs) Yes. They were born here and raised here. So they've known this lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. And the restaurant, when did that start? Like Hmm. shortly after that or? No. 
Our story is kind of a slow one. We got into this life very slowly and step by step as it wasn't planned. You know, when I, when I read and I, and, I, and I meet all these homestead mamas, a lot of them, uh, I really, uh, it's really interesting because they had a plan. Uh, they really wanted that kind of life. I, I, I didn't. I mean, it's not that I didn't want it, yeah. but I never thought about it. And I just found right. myself here. I always say it was my the biggest luck of my life because if I didn't buy this farm, I would never have known what I really wanted to be in life. <laughs> So we started quite slowly and year after year we were adding something and then it became like a real farm. And then we said, okay, but there is also the money part, you know, passion is very important, mm -hmm. but there is also, you know, the, the passion is not everything. Right. <laughs> I also yeah. wanted to have a little bit of income out of it. And so I have always loved cooking and I said, okay, why don't we add that? To this but this came only in 2016 and we've been living here since 2002 so okay yeah see. yeah several years Slow after process we're supposed to be talking about winter cooking but i want to ask you so many questions about that <laughs> so yeah like where people <laughs> do people just who are local come to your restaurant or do they come from all over um let's say 50 percent are local and 50% are uh, come from nearby areas. Instagram has been has helped a lot with that uh, because I mean it's it's a way to get to people get to know you and right. they're curious so they travel a little bit also to to come and eat here. So yeah. Yeah, my husband said you need to make reservations. I'm like kind of a little bit farther away for people with seven kids. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was sold right away. He wanted to go. <laughs> So, oh yeah, yeah. He will be most than welcome. He was checking out your Instagram and your website and everything, looking at everything. He was sold. So let's let let's dive into some of the food and some things that you're enjoying making. It doesn't just have to be in your restaurant, but in your home. What kind of comforting foods are you specifically enjoying right now in the winter time? Oh wow, uh, the winter time is. Uh... Is where I have a little bit more time to cook. Right, yeah. Because, let's be honest. <laughs> in summer, it's always a big rush. And yeah. fortunately, the kids, they help. I mean, they're used to that. So sometimes they cook. or But in the winter, we have a little bit more time. So, yeah. I would say that in winter, we love to have soups. Mm -hmm. yes. And what I really like um, is to have like a uh, veloute. So it's like um, a soup uh, made out of with one vegetable plus potatoes so that you can really savor uh, the one ingredient. Let's say, I don't know, squash other, or leeks. Okay. Uh, so I just cook them with oil and a lot of, a lot of, let's say a lot of uh, squash. I cook it in the pan with oil yeah. and then I add some water and some broth or vegetable stock. And then I put it in a mixer and like have it really, really smooth. And then mm. add some bread in it, uh, you know, very simple, but um I don't know. I, I am very much at home. In the, in the restaurant, it's a little bit different. But at home, uh, I like to really enjoy and give like the highlight on the one ingredient we okay. have in that moment. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. think I do that very often, but I like the idea of it. Usually it's throwing in as much as I possibly can, but I like the idea of highlighting one thing. Yes, I think it's both way. I mean, in winter, it's like a necessity, <laughs> and but it also comes out very, very nice. I mean, a, a warm bowl of uh, pumpkin soup with a little bit of herbs or a little bit of bread, toasted bread. It's really simple. And if you add some potatoes, it's also quite energetic. So, yeah. yeah. What kind of broths are you making in your kitchen so basically and mainly i use a uh, vegetable broth and this is something that can be i think uh, kind of interesting what i do when i cook vegetables i keep the scraps 
Mm-hmm. Uh, is scraps the correct word in English? Yeah. Yep. The, the things you cut when you, yeah. Yes. Okay. I mm-hmm. keep them. I <laughs> wash them very, very nicely and I put them away. If I don't have time, I freeze them. Okay. And then when I have a little bit of time, I take all of this, I cut them in quite small pieces and then I cook them with salt, quite a good amount of salt in a non-sticky pan until they have uh, released all their water. And then again, in a mixer, I, um, you make a kind of a paste of it, which mm. is really very salty and very, uh-huh. very flavory. And then I put this paste in the ice molds, little ice oh. molds. So I have this like um, vegetable uh, stock cubes mm-hmm. that I use later on, either to have uh, like simple broth with maybe some egg pasta in it, or I use them, I add them to give some flavor to anything. <laughs> you can use them in risotto, you can use them when you cook meat, whatever. And I think that's a very good way to use your kitchen uh, scraps. Yeah. So is there water involved or it's just cooking them with the salt in the pan? No water. No water. Only salt. Okay. They will, you cook them very slowly so they will release all their water and they will kind of dry out, but the mm-hmm. salt will keep it like a paste. Right. And then so you can really scoop it in the ice molds. Are you doing peels of any kind or just ends like ends of a carrot ends of a leek or what kind of things are you putting in? this is interesting I've never done something like this before yes it's like when you when you peel the carrot I mean you, if, if you peel the carrot you wash it before and then you peel it and you keep the peels or when for example you have the green part of the leeks mm-hmm. that again you can use that or for example the the leaves of an onion you will eventually I mean, throw away or I don't know when you cut a cabbage and you, you take out the, the, um, the outside leaves, you can use them. You can use whatever, uh, you, you have, I mean, as, as, as long as you like it, you can use it. Yeah. And it's really, really very, very useful. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. I'm trying to think of how I could incorporate something like that in my kitchen, just to add a little punch of flavor to things. Normally, I find myself putting all of those same scraps in with bones and making a bone broth, but I've never thought about Mm -hmm. not using any water and making the paste. Yeah, that that's 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 something um, in Italy. I'm I'm I don't know if it's the same in the states, but in Italy, a lot of people add uh, this is uh, is called these stock cubes that they buy in the store. Yeah, but they're really not that good and not really healthy because they add a lot of other stuff right. you know, to give flavor and you never know what there is in the, those things. Yeah. But I mean, this is homemade. Yeah. Yeah. That would be something similar to, we have bouillon cubes. I guess maybe that yes, would be similar exactly. to that. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I didn't have the world, but that's it. Okay. That's so it, it is the bouillon cubes. Interesting. I wonder how to make that with a bone base or if it would be possible in any way to do something like that. Because they sell like chicken bouillon cubes, but I have no clue how one would recreate that same idea. Well, I think it's possible. The important thing is just that you have quite a bit of salt and no liquids added. So you okay. just let it cook very, very slowly. And the salt helps all the, the liquids to get out from the um, vegetables or meat. And then I think it works exactly the same. Okay, nice. What are some herbs and spices this time of year that are you find making their way more into your dishes that are warm and comforting? Are there any that overwinter where you live? Yes, not very many, but yeah. yes, um, we always have um, sage. Yes, that's that the one we have around. <laughs> yeah. Yes, she survives also under yeah. under snow. Yeah. And one herb that I really, really like is bay, bay leaves. Okay. Uh, I, I add them to everything. <laughs> I really like the flavor and those as well they they uh survive through the winter 
And I also dry quite a lot of herbs uh, during the spring and summer mm -hmm. and autumn so that then I have some herbs powder always uh, at hand. That is yeah. really, I mean, you don't need that much because herbs are so, and especially when they're dried, their flavor is even more intense. So you don't need to have that much, but, you know, just a, a jar for each herb and it will do. I have chive and I have, oh, I have nettles mm, dried out. And then I have... Um, Ah, I, I also dry um, elderflowers. Oh, and okay. those I use very much in the winter. Yes, for teas. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I've never thought to use that. We went and picked elderflowers last summer, and the I just didn't even know what to do with them. I, we made fritters with them, but I didn't think to use them as a, an herb to dry it out and use it in soups or. What other application do you use them? Yes, it's very, the elderflowers are really something that people here use a lot. And every family has um, its uh, recipe for elderflower syrup, oh. which we make really, every family makes a lot of it. And then we exchange them. And I mean, it's pretty always the same, but we have slightly different recipes. So we exchange recipes and it lasts all through the winter. And it's something you, I mean, there is always a bottle of elderflower syrup here at, in the farms. Oh, okay. So is that sugar-based or honey-based or how is it made? Unfortunately, it's sugar-based. Okay. <laughs> so it's Just, really, yeah. you have to be kind of, you know, don't indulge too much. But um, it's really easy to make because it's like uh, you have 10 flowers. They are very intense in their flavor, so you don't need that many. And it's like one liter water, 10 flowers, sliced lemon, and then you leave it for a couple of days. And then you drain the water and put sugar in the water quite a good amount, I would say alpha kilo, and then you cook it and bottle it. And that's it. It's really very easy, very easy to make. Yeah. That, so then people put it on pancakes, maybe in desserts or... We more like, we more like uh, drink it as a, in summer, we drink it with uh, cold water. Oh, okay. Like a lemonade and or something. And in winter, we add warm water. Okay. So we have a light, something like of a tea. Yeah. Yeah. That is another topic I wanted to talk about a little bit was drinks because I'm always wanting something hot in my hand all day long in the winter. It's one of the best things about winter that in the wood stove. Otherwise I would totally not like it. Yeah. What are some other drinks you're finding yourself making over there? Oh, this one we make a lot. Yeah. Uh, this is one of our favorite. And yes, uh, I I mean, I try not to drink too much of that because there is a lot of sugar. This is why I also dry flowers. That's the second option. <laughs> so that you use the flowers, uh, the elder flowers to make to make tea. I also make syrups out of uh, roses, and that's also a very, very good one. And also you can use it both in summer with cold water and in winter with, uh, with warm water. That's also an option. I mean, yes, syrups are really uh, very, I use them a lot. I Interesting. Lot. That is not something, unless I'm just way out of the loop, I don't know that anybody really does that around here. I hadn't thought to make a syrup with an herb and then take that syrup and then put it in hot water. And that's, a re that would be a really simple drink to have all winter long. Yes. <laughs> I also have uh, a couple of jars of mint syrup. Okay. And that is also, you can drink it warm. Yeah. yeah I mean, basically all of them, you can drink them warm. Yeah. That is a good idea. I hadn't thought to do something like that. I wanted to ask you more about your polenta and how you're, how do you flavor it? Do you just use salt and mostly just highlight the corn or what are some ways that you flavor that? Okay, so the basic polenta, traditional polenta, is just corn flour, water, and salt. And we cook it in a special uh, pan that it's made of. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know the English word. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's a metal. It's like, it looks like gold, but it's oh, not gold. Copper? No, not copper. Okay, yeah, yes. That's it. That's okay. it. We got it. Copper. <laughs> and yeah, that's really typical. And it's, uh, we uh, usually make it on the wood stove. Oh. That's really the typical polenta. It's so typical that in this area that most of um, the families have it every Sunday. I mean, okay. you don't call it a Sunday if there is not polenta for lunch. Oh, okay. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. My mother-in-law, she taught me how to, how to make it because there is a special way to mix it. You cannot just mix. Like you have to have a special uh, training from your mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Typical, typical dish. You can also have something that we call polenta concha. That means that almost at the end of the cooking, you add some um, some cheese, oh, some okay. grated cheese, and to make it a little bit more, you know, interesting in flavor yeah. and and n- nutritious, which is really also very easy. I mean, you grate some cheese and you add it uh, at the end of the cooking, or sometimes um, at the restaurant. In summer, I add uh, some herbs. Yes, that's like rosemary or uh, or a mixture of rosemary, sage, thyme, all these kind of herbs. Now, is that a side dish? Or when you say people have polenta on Sunday, are they eating something with the polenta or just a big bowl of warm polenta? No, it's a side dish because... Okay. Um, the thing is that in this area, there is not very much a tradition for bread because okay. it's too, uh, it's too, we're too high and um, it was very difficult to grow wheat because it's too cold. Okay. So, but corn adapted very well when it arrived from the, from America, basically. <laughs> so our traditional dish comes from America, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this is why... There is not that much bread tradition, okay. But polenta is is the same as bread. So they usually eat rabbit with it. Okay, rabbit is very very common here, uh, or any kind of meat with sauce or eggs. You can have eggs with it, whatever you like. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely gonna try. It. I don't know if you believe this, but I've never made polenta in my entire life. So <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> it sounds good. I, I really believe it because it, this is something interesting. I made some research about it. Uh, and you know what? That when polenta came to uh, Europe, uh, it had this big success uh, because it was so easy to grow and so productive. So Europeans got really crazy about <laughs> about corn. <Yeah. laughs> but they developed their own method to uh, to eat it, which is basically making polenta, which was not not which had nothing to do with where it came from because uh, I don't in America they didn't do it, they didn't do polenta, they did something different. That's interesting. Yeah, you it know, is how food connects. It is because I mean I've obviously heard of polenta, but I've never thought to make it. But it seems like a really nice carb to add to a meal because it it's pretty simple. Yes, it is. I'm thinking about though like sourcing because you grow corn. I'm not sure where I would source a good quality corn. Do you have any online recommendations that you know of? Uh it's it's quite difficult here as well. Is it? Because I mean it's very easy to find polenta in the stores here. But the thing is that to have a longer shelf life, they uh, even the best polenta uh, meals, they have to take out the oil because otherwise the shelf life will be really, really short. So the polenta that you buy in store is always very, very dry. On the other hand, the polenta that we have, it's our corn, so we grind it just before just before cooking, and it has all the nutrients, oil as well. So it's kind of, it's really different. It's very oily, much more nourishing, and much more flavor. It has much more mm-hmm. flavor in it. Yeah. So, huh. Yeah. I don't know. In your area, do they, do, do they grow uh, corn? Yes, but it's all genetically modified corn oh. that I that I know of. So okay. yeah, I think it'd be kind of challenging. Mm. It's it's difficult to find it even for animal feed to find non-GMO 
crops, but I'll check out some of my usual sources. Um, what about grains? So you said that you can't really grow it in your area, but I know that you do some sourdough. So what are you, what are you using for mm-hmm. that? So uh, basically, uh, okay, in this area, they used to grow uh, rye, okay, which is very very much adaptable to uh, to man to the mountain territory, and barley, oat. Well, I use wheat as well. Yes, basically I use uh, these grains. Okay, so are those what you're using to make your sourdough loaves? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you have any tried and true recipes for your sourdough, or is it something that you've experimented with, or did it come from any cookbooks or anything? Oh wow, <laughs> sourdough was uh, a, a, is, a, is still a journey. It was and it is a, a journey, yeah. as you as you as you know. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, sourdough was the first thing I, I might say that my journey as a homesteader started with sourdough because it was the first thing I learned to do with my hands. That uh, opened for me so many doors because I realized I could make actually could make something with my hands and and it turned out good. So <laughs> so from there, I mean, I never stopped. Yeah, it had. I, it's more than 10 years that I bake with sourdough and things have changed a lot. Uh, Now I use more, a more liquid sourdough. I used to have a a stiff one. Okay. Now I have a more liquid one. Yeah. I also wrote a book of sourdough recipes. Oh, okay. Uh, Unfortunately, it's only in Italian and German. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Well, if anybody in my (laughs) listeners uh, speak Italian and German, that would be a good one to get your hands on. (laughs) <laughs> and well, yes, there are also some traditional recipes here with sourdough. I mean, they're mm, they don't do them anymore with sourdough, but I'm pretty sure they were with sourdough. I mean, people used to bake with it uh, until Second World War, so for sure they were. So yeah, what are some of the traditional ways that just a normal sourdough bread loaf or any kind of other recipes that people make around there? Uh, w- Yes, there is one recipe that I really love because it's very typical from this particular valley where I live in. And this is a peculiar valley because we are just 2,000 people. (laughs) So it's very, very small. And 1,000 out of 2,000, they speak uh, a very different dialect. It's a German uh, dialect. So they don't speak Italian actually, but they speak an an ancient German because they came from Germany in the Middle Age and they were so much isolated that they never mixed with the Italian people. So until today, they maintain their language, which I find really fascinating. And uh, yes, that's really very interesting. And they have also their own recipes. And one of them is, I really love it because... It tells a story of, you know, poor people in the mountain that did, you know, the best that they could with what little ingredients they had. So they're called kukalar and they are kind of little, like little bread fritters, I would say. So, and they're very simple because you make a dough with sourdough, um, buttermilk, buttermilk rye flour, a little bit of old purpose flour, and a uh, half a teaspoon of baking soda. Uh, and you make an oil, olive oil, and you make this dough, which is a little bit sticky. And it's nice because you can put the dough in the fridge and then it will last one week. So when you want to make this uh, little kind of pancakes, you just take the dough and you uh, you make the the pancake and you put it on a non sticky pan or directly on the wooden stove and they will cook in like 2 minutes and this is really very very typical from here okay so it's a rye based little pancake with, yes yeah that sounds really good yeah it seems like something my kids would absolutely love it seems to me the focus for you and your home and your restaurant is really figuring out how to take simple ingredients and make them as delicious as they possibly can be and really highlight things in the simple form, but making the flavor come out of them. Yes, exactly. I think 
that's, you know, that kind of closed the circle of <laughs> our life and choice uh, and being able to offer this to other people and to explain to them what it means to us, uh, to this food. It's really, I mean, I'm really grateful that I could end up doing that because it's really, um, it's like, I feel like I'm kind of, worshiping <laughs> my you know the land I've been given and in the best way I I can and really I try to keep it simple uh to keep it simple so not to add too many ingredients this is kind right. of yeah uh because I really want what I what we grow to you know be the star <laughs> right yeah yeah and bring out the flavors with simple things yeah. without I'm always okay, more ingredients, add this vegetable, add this herb, and we're going to really amp it up. And sometimes there's a place for just simplicity in taking something like corn and making it into something delicious. Yeah. I've, I've noticed we have been, I don't know if you know what WOOF is, Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farming. It's um, uh, an association that puts together farmers and volunteers from all over the world. So we have been wolf host for quite a long time and we had people from all over the world here and we had so much exchange uh, about the way of cooking. And yeah, I think most of them, what they noticed, people from other parts of the world, was exactly this, that Italian cooking in general tend to be quite uh, simple in a way. So we don't use many ingredients in dishes, and each dish has its highlight ingredient. That's kind of what uh, what was the, the feedback from them. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm noticing too. But I really like the idea. It keeps it simple and it gives you space to perfect a technique with one particular ingredient instead of adding more to maybe cover up the taste of <laughs> yeah. making an error on it and just getting better and better <laughs> at that one particular. How about... Pasta. Are you making pasta as well, or do people not really do that in your area as much? Um, I mean, yes, but there are other areas in Italy that are more famous for their pasta. Uh, I would say Central Italy is more famous. I do a lot of egg pasta though, uh, because it's so simple and so. I mean. You can do so many things with egg pasta. You can do lasagne, you can do tagliatelle, you can do... I mean, sometimes I just uh, have broth with some, you know, I have tagliatelle in the freezer and I just break them in it, in the broth and have this soup of uh, tagliatelle and broth. Uh, or you can have a more complicated lasagna. It's, it's really something I love with just eggs and flour. That's it. I mean, it's so exciting. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are you using the rye for that as well? Mm, no, no. In that case, I use wheat flour. Yeah. Wheat flour, yeah. It, yes. Okay. It's a classical egg pasta. Okay. Yeah. That is delicious. I like to make pasta with einkorn flour, the ancient wheat. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have access to that. Yeah. I know that you probably do. I think it's a lot of it's grown over there, right? Einkorn, yeah, yes, it is, it is, yes, yes, and and uh, I mean, in the uh, sourdough bakers community, is quite uh, is quite common to use einkorn. Yeah, yeah. Are there any more favorite recipes? I saw on your Instagram stories where you made foam cookies. Oh yeah, that's those. Ah, uh, that's a good. Jewish uh, recipe. Uh, it's not really typical from here and yes, they're, uh, they're really easy. It's like, uh, egg white and, and sugar and some nuts and, and that's it basically. <laughs> that was really okay. very, very yeah. easy to make. And, uh, yes, we made, we made them last year on the Remembrance Day. Yeah. Well, that's a, a really such a wide word, you know, deserts. Uh, my, I know. <laughs> <laughs> My second daughter is specialized on those. Okay. Yes. Oh, tiramisu is something very typical. Yes. Very typical Italian. 
but uh, I suggest you don't have it on a daily basis because it's really, really, yeah. you know what the word tiramisu means? No, I do not. <laughs> tiramisu means uh, pick me up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite easy. Uh, it's uh, a layer of biscuits and then you have to make this cream with mascarpone uh, I don't know I mean I'm sure you have uh, mascarpone yeah I don't know if there is an English word uh, no that's just the it's word we use mascarpone yeah it's in English the same yes yes Okay, super. And you uh, make a cream with mascarpone and egg yolks uh, and sugar. And then you um, dunk the biscuits in coffee. And then you make a layer of biscuits of uh, dunked in coffee. And then a layer of this mascarpone cream. And then a layer of biscuits. And then a layer of mascarpone cream. Oh, and you go on so <laughs> until you finish your ingredients and then you put it in the fridge, and that's really delicious. Easy yeah. and delicious. Are you making the uh, biscuits portion from scratch as well? Uh, no, basically because uh, the traditional mascarpone is made with a specific kind of biscuits, okay. which are quite difficult okay. to make at home. They're called savoyardi. But you can really uh, use whatever biscuits you have on hand, or you can also make them. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be good. Either way, it sounds delicious, but I need to make it in the morning or I will be up all night, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us more about where everybody can find you, your Instagram, your website, or where you want to direct people to check out more about your restaurant if they happen to be somewhat in the area they can come check it all out oh yeah i had i had some uh, some visitors from the states this oh. year uh, a couple that uh, yes that i met through homestead mamas okay. and they managed to come so that was really exciting <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we are on instagram mostly it, that's the the social i really mm -hmm. like the best so it's uh mas del saro on Instagram or on our website, uh, yes, where you can find also the menu. I try to translate almost everything in English on Instagram as well, yeah. especially after I joined the Homestead Mamas community. So I feel like, you know, um, to be uh, as inclusive as, as I can. Uh, so, yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, no, I... I looked through your stories and noticed that everything was had the English subtitles and made it to where I could actually understand it all. We appreciate all that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me and talking about food. I found this conversation really fascinating. Do you give farm tours and people come out to your restaurant? <laughs> thinking like that would be so fun to see yes of course especially before lunch you know they, especially it's my husband to do that because he's the one serving in i'm, I'm in the in the kitchen and he's outside yeah. so yes he he's very proud of his pigs especially oh, okay. so he always wants to yeah, show the pigs show to everybody <laughs> oh that's yeah. so cool well if anybody can get out to italy get over there uh definitely go check out Bea and her amazing restaurant and farm and also check her out over on Instagram and all that they have going on. You can at least just be a peering in, even if you can't make it over to Italy. Oh yeah. I hope, I hope to have many of you here. I mean, <laughs> visiting, yes. that would be lovely. And we are planning a trip to the States. Oh. Now, so where yeah. are you headed in the States? Oh, our idea, but now it's just a dream, but we're starting to talk quite a lot about it. Our idea would be to uh, to have like a three months off and travel all through the States with an RV or a caravan and visiting all the homestead I've been watching on the Instagram. That's my oh. big dream. <laughs> parking that, in their backyards so <laughs> cool yeah if you i'm serious if you come to missouri definitely uh which you will because missouri's right in the middle so you know yeah. you have to go through missouri pretty much yes <laughs> for sure you're gonna hit for sure north or south <laughs> but yeah you can uh message me and um park your rv in our property oh thank you we will do that <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I'm sure you're making contacts all over the place. Yes, yes. No, it's it's really an amazing community. I have to say, Homestead Mamas, I was surprised of how involved I I got from all of you. I mean, it's really it's it's so different from how we farm here, but it's so inspiring. I mean. For me, it's mm-hmm. really inspiring. It's something new and fresh and, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's how I feel about yours too. It's always interesting to see how people do things in all parts of the world. It's really neat. Yes, and I'm, I'm really, I mean, you, you are one of my heroes because, I mean, <laughs> to see you with seven kids and, you know, managing all of it and, wow, that's, that's really great. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Make sure to go check out Vea, all her socials, find out what's going on on the farm and in the restaurant. As always, thank you so much for listening. And I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast.